Well, hopefully this will help uh, just to give us an idea as we follow along in our, our study of Ezra tonight. We're going to be looking at the first chapter, uh, verses 1 through 11. And this is um, a continuation of the um, uh, narrative of Second Chronicles. And, and Ezra shows us in his prophecy how God fulfills a promise to return his people to the promised land the land he had given them, even after they had been exiled because of their sin. And so some people have called this Israel's second exodus. And so uh, this time they're coming from Babylon. Uh, and as we um, look at this, I'm going to read uh, the first few verses here in chapter 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth of the Lord, has the Lord God of heaven has given me. And he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the, of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock besides the freewill offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all whose spirits God had moved arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with precious things besides all that was willingly offered. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and put in the temple of his God. And Cyrus, king of Persia, brought them out by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and counted them out to Sheshbazzar, the king, or the prince, rather, of Judah. This is the number of them. 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives, 30 gold basins, 410 silver basins of a similar kind, and 1,000 other articles. All the articles of gold and silver were 5,400. All these Sheshbazar took with the captives who were brought from Babylon to Jerusalem. Now, there are a couple of major events of the Old Testament. And if you think back, the first being the exodus from Egypt. And then there was the exodus from Babylon. There was a, a famous story written in 1900 by Frank Baum. This is a story that's been a classic for ages and is a classic still today, The Wizard of Oz. And in 1939, Judy Garland played the role of her life as Dorothy in the movie version. Dorothy, the young girl from Kansas who, with her dog Toto, went to the land of Oz. And at the end of the movie, she wakes up safely and she looks around her bed at her family and she says, there really is no place like home. Many of us have probably said that as well, haven't we? Maybe even after being on vacation, maybe a wonderful vacation that we enjoyed greatly, but we look forward to being back home, to sleeping in our own beds, to being around things that are familiar. And perhaps we've made that statement. There really is no place like home. Um, I enjoyed my trip with William 
to New York last week, but um, after a couple of trips over a couple of those bridges and those tolls I had to pay, I kept thinking, you know, there's no place like home. I paid $42 to go over one bridge one time. And other bridges, almost every time, $15, $15, $15. I don't know how people live up there. I don't know how they can afford to. But I found myself saying, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go home. There's no place like home. You know, we don't have the potholes they have, and we don't have to pay $15 every time we cross a bridge. We may not have some of the luxuries. We may not have some of the entertainment or historical sites, but there's no place like home. For the children of Israel, we think about that exodus from Egypt where they had been enslaved. They came to the promised land. And then in 586 B.C., they were taken into captivity in Babylon. For more than 820 years, the children of Israel had lived in the promised land, the land that God had promised and gave them. But then they were taken into exile. God worked supernaturally to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, and he worked supernaturally again to bring them out of Babylonian captivity and back into the promised land. For over 800 years, they had made their home in Israel. In 586, they were taken into captivity by the Babylonians, and they stayed there for almost 70 years. Now think about all those children who were born during those 70 years. 70 years is a lifetime for, for many, more than a lifetime for many. And all the children who were born during that time heard about the promised land. They heard about the exodus from Egypt. They heard about God rescuing them from slavery. They heard stories about the temple, how God had led his people. Yet they were living once again as captives in a foreign land. In the first verse here, Ezra tells us that Cyrus was king of Persia. The Persian Empire had, had swallowed up all of Babylon by this time. And the Lord began to work in the heart of King Cyrus. And here we see that his heart, his spirit was stirred by God. And Cyrus began to recognize the necessity of allowing God's people to return to the promised land. And he would even assist them in rebuilding their temple in Jerusalem. So here we begin, or we see what, what is the beginning of their return to the promised land, to their homeland. Ezra tells us the story of that return and how they rebuilt the temple. Now, understanding that this is the plan and the intent the book of, of Ezra, we get an understanding ourselves of what God does in and through his people, what he did then and what he wants to do now, what he is doing. And in the first chapter here, there are three underlying principles that I want us to especially notice. And they are the premise for the whole book of Ezra. And the first premise that we see is that God is a God of judgment. He is a God of judgment. The reason the children of Israel, God's children, were, were exiled to Babylonian ca captivity is because of their open rebellion against God. They had rebelled, and, and even Isaiah tells us 
of how God had warned them. If you look on your listening sheet, you see these verses from Isaiah chapter 3. Observe this. The Lord God of hosts is about to remove from Jerusalem and from Judah every kind of security, the entire supply of bread and water. For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because they have spoken and acted against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. The look on their faces testifies against them. And like Sodom, God compares his people to the people of Sodom. They flaunt their sin. They do not conceal it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. The children of Israel were defiant against God's perfect and holy will. They brought this judgment upon themselves. They knew that God is holy. They knew that God is perfect. And they knew that God must punish sin. God, according to the Bible, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, God is still holy. He's still perfect. And he still judges sin. And so his judgment for Israel was to send them into a foreign land and leaving their nation behind, destroyed, including the temple. So, how can this be? How can a loving God punish people that he has chosen, his own chosen people like this? Well, he is holy, and God does not allow sin. What does Romans 3.23 tell us? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we know that all people fall into the same category. Romans also tells us that the wages of sin is what? death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, wages of sin equals death. Why were they not killed? Think about wages. When you work for someone for wages, you don't necessarily receive your rate wages daily. Your wages may not come to you until a later time. In fact, most, in most cases, your wages don't come to you until a later time. But if you work for an honest and ethical company or person, your wages will come to you eventually. And if God tells us the wages of sin is death, then we know that there's going to be a payday. And that's what the late Dr. R.G. Lee used to preach. There will be a payday someday. That it is surely coming. God is a God of judgment. Now, thanks be to God, that's not the end of the story. Thankfully, we don't have to worry about judgment if we've trusted Him through Christ. If we've been restored to a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, through salvation. And that's part of the second point, that our God is a God of restoration. For the children of Israel in captivity, things really could not have been worse. They had lost everything. They were taken into a foreign land, Family units were split apart, even destroyed. The homes they left behind in Judah had been inhabited by, by strangers and foreigners. They had literally taken over their land. Many of them even watched as the temple was being destroyed. The place where they were so proud to, to honor their God. And if you've ever experienced anything like that, you know the, the sinking feeling, whether it's a, a home 
or a place of business that's destroyed, but even more so a place of worship. You know, and, and we, we watched as, as we lost a, a place of worship in the last uh, church I served, and, and we, were, we were without a church home, so to speak, facility-wise, for almost a year. And that's a, that's a feeling unlike any other that you can have. It's a, it's a really one of those pit of the stomach uh, feelings when, when fire or any other tragedy strikes and destroys a place of worship. And so for insult added to injury, after having lost their homes, after having lost their livelihoods, after having lost their families, now the one thing they thought they could rely on was God, they're losing their house of worship also. And the captivity didn't last for days or weeks or months or even years. It lasted for decades. For 70 years, they were in captivity. But when the Persians took over in Babylon, Cyrus became king. And the good news about that is that God began to work in Cyrus's heart. God began to move Cyrus. When Cyrus was stirred, he, he told the people that they could return to Judah. Look at verse 3. Who among you, of, who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord. God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. So he, he told them they could go back to Jerusalem and Judah. He even told them that the temple would be rebuilt. Thus says Cyrus in verse 2, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven, has given me. And he, God, has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. What's more, Cyrus told the people that he would gather an offering to help pay for the temple. We see this in verse 4. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with gold and silver, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And then he, he told them that all the treasures that had been taken from the temple during its destruction under King Nebuchadnezzar would be returned freely. In verse 7, King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem, and put in the temple of his gods. So even sin that was committed against God's people prior to Cyrus becoming king was being rectified by Cyrus. He was, he was doing something to make up to the people that he had not caused. See, God was at work in Cyrus and through Cyrus to restore God's people and to restore his house of worship. We worship a God of restoration. Our God is a God of restoration. We often focus on the fact that he is a God of judgment without thinking about him as a God of restoration. One of the great illustrations of this is a parable Jesus told of the, good, of the um, prodigal son. And if you remember in that parable, the son went out and wasted and, and, and just, just blew it all. Not just money, but his life, basically. He wasted it away. 
Money he wasn't even deserving of at that point in his life. But his father had lovingly given to him. And he went out and wasted it all. And instead of, of writing his son off as a lost cause who he would never see or hear from again, that father must have waited every day looking down the road for his son to return. The son went out and though he had blown everything and had reached the very bottom of life, quite literally, he had enough sense to go back to his father's house. He had enough sense to think, you know, if I go back and am apologetic and, and contrite at heart, maybe he'll at least let me work for him. Maybe I'll at least have, have a place to sleep and, and food to eat. Maybe he'll at least let me hang around. And we know what the father did. The father saw his son coming up the road and he ran out to meet him, threw his arms around him and welcomed him back home. And, and he, he had threw a big party and he gave that son his rightful place in the home an honored place a place he didn't deserve because he had wasted his opportunities and so judgment says he did this to himself he's done be done with him but restoration and love and grace of God says, welcome him back with open arms. And that's exactly what the Father did. And that is the example that Jesus shows us of how our Father in heaven cares about us. That even though we blow it, even though we mess up big time, even though we may reach the very bottom in life, we have a heavenly Father who loves us and who is waiting with open arms for us to come back to Him. He never leaves us. We may leave Him, but He never leaves us. He never turns His back on us. If we refuse to come back to Him, yes, there will be judgment. But if we are willing to come back to Him, He will accept us. He will love us. He will restore us. Our God is ready to restore. And so what does that say about us? If our Father is ready to restore and our goal as Christians is to be little Christ, quite literally, as the word is interpreted, if, if we are to, to be like Him then we must be people of restoration and not people of judgment. Realizing that, that God is the only true judge, that God is the only righteous judge, that He is the only fair judge, and that He wishes us to be people who restore broken people broken homes, broken relationships, broken anything when it comes to His people. And so, as the church, that's what we're called to do. And as Christians, that's what we're called to do. To be people of restoration, realizing that we serve a God of restoration. And so that is when someone who has hurt us or who has done damage to the church even comes back and is willing to admit their, 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 their wrong, we must be willing to receive them as that father welcomed the prodigal son back home. As hard as that may be, and as much as that goes against our culture, as much as that goes against our human nature even, but just as God provided restoration to the Israelites through Cyrus, 
Today he provides restoration through a different king. And not an earthly king, but the king of kings and lord of lords. His only begotten son, Jesus. He's ready to forgive. He's ready to restore. He's ready to accept you and I. And he is able to help us forgive. He is able to help us restore and accept others as well. He restores and he saves to the uttermost. He's a God of judgment, but He's a God of restoration. And thirdly, He is a God who deserves our best. God deserves our best. Listen to verses 9 and 10. This is the number of them, 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives, 30 gold basins, 410 silver basins of a similar kind, and 1,000 other articles. Here we find all of the the chest of gold and silver and, and sacrificial knives, the bowls, all of the basins and urns that were gathered up. Things that, that Cyrus had nothing to do with their confiscation or, or theft even, if you want to call it that. They were gathered up by Cyrus more than 5,000 different vessels and they were returned from Babylon to Jerusalem. Why? These were, these were items, articles that would, would, would fill the temple. And so not only was Cyrus willing to help rebuild the temple, he was willing to help restore it to its former glory. To bring back in the articles that had been taken. And I think these verses remind us that God deserves our very best. The fact that these were articles in the temple to begin with show us that, that these people were serious about the God they worshipped. Now, if you think about it, any of us who furnishes our homes want to do so as best as we possibly can can afford to. We want to furnish our homes with the very best we can afford. For some, that is going to look different than others. But we do the best that we can. How do we feel when it comes to the house of the Lord? Do we want the very best? Or do we want just good enough. You know, one of the story I tell that, that I never forget is, is the guy who called me and, and said, Preacher, you know, I, I think we need a gas grill at the church. You think we could use a gas grill down at the church for all the, all the different functions we have out there outside and, and, and you wouldn't have to bring your grill and others wouldn't have to bring their grill if we had a grill down at the church that belonged to the church that stayed there? And I said, Sure, I think that's a great idea. He said, Good, I just bought me a new grill. I'm going to bring my old one down there and leave it. Think about that. What does that say about the importance of God's house? What's more, my curiosity was so, and you know, was so pricked that I went down and 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 sure enough, this grill was all rusted. The burners were completely rusted and in need of being replaced. The the grill as a whole, you know, was missing parts and and just needed to be trashed. And that's eventually what happened to it um, very shortly after. And, and, you know, and I just told the guy, I said, look, you know, this is God's house and we're, we're giving him the leftovers. We're giving him the things that aren't good enough for us to keep. That's not giving our best to God. God deserves better than that. He doesn't deserve our hand-me-downs when they're in such condition that we no longer want them. Now, there are things we can give to God to, and to His people and to His church that, that will benefit it, whether they're brand new or not. I'm not saying they have to be the very top of the line of everything. But we need to do the best that we can afford to do for God. We need to give Him our best, in other words. Not the best that, 
the people at, at some other church can do, but the best that we can do. So we don't need to compare ourselves to others, but rather compare ourselves to what we are at home, to who we are at home. Are we doing our best? How can we bring our very best, the gold and silver, if you will, of our lives to God when we have anger or bitterness toward other people in our hearts? When we have feelings of superiority? When, we, when we're just not willing to, to be submissive because of our own pride? The Lord who has redeemed us and restored us deserves so much more. He deserves our very best. He deserves more than that. The least we can do is our best. Remember the story of the lad who had the loaves and fishes? And he gave not some of what he had, but all of what he had to Jesus. Not just part of his lunch that day, but all of it. He gave it to Jesus, and Jesus did the miraculous with it. He blessed it, multiplied it, and he fed up thousands of people, and he had lots of leftovers. Because Someone was obedient, a little boy, no less, and gave his very best to the Lord. I dare say when we give our very best to the Lord, he blesses it. He uses it, multiplying it, and blesses others. And so the question is, have we given our best to Him? Have you given your best to the Lord? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes and, and just think on this. Have you given your very best to the Lord? He deserves so much more than anything we can give Him. So the least we can do is give him our all, our best. He is a God of judgment. But because of the King, Jesus, he is a God of restoration, and you and I have access to salvation. We can be restored through him. He deserves our best. Heavenly Father, we often look for shortcuts and ways to avoid giving our best to you. When we truly love someone, we want them to have the best. The best of us and the best of what we have. Father, we say we love you. And Lord, if we love you, that means that we want to give you, to offer you our very best. The best of who we are, the best of what we have. The best of our time, our talents, and our treasures. Help us as we leave this place tonight to go out into this world and give you our best. To remember that you indeed are a God of judgment, but you're also a God of restoration. And if we're obedient, submissive, and repentant toward you, giving you the best of ourselves, you'll bless us. Father, we pray now for our brothers and sisters who are unable to be here. 
particularly those who are sick, those who are in nursing homes, those, Lord, who are struggling with issues of self-worth, with, with addiction, with, with marital conflict, family issues with siblings and, and parents and children, those, Lord, who are, who are just trying to find the answer to the question why. whatever that entails for them. Help us, Lord, to love them. Help us, Lord, to, to show them that you indeed are a God of restoration and that you're deserving of our very best. Lord, we know the greatest way we can show people anything is through our own example, our actions. So help us, Lord, to be loyal to those promises. To be faithful in, in giving you our best and setting that example. Father, we pray now that you would just help us this week to be a blessing to others and make a difference in this world for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.